What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the Sheehan Show here on Shardog.com. My name is Sean Sheehan, and I'm delighted to be joined for the first time this year by Brad Wharton to look ahead to Cage Warriors. And it's not one, but two Cage Warriors cards this week as we have an unplugged Cage Warriors 167 and a Cage Warriors 168 card as well to the fourth. Brad, how are you? How are things? It, feel, it feels like years since we've talked. It's been, it's been that long. Have you been keeping well? Yeah, man, it does. You know, we um, we had our first Cage Warriors show of the year uh, a few weeks ago in uh, in February, and I realised it had been three months since I commentated on an MMA event, which is quarter of a year, which seems absolutely insane. But you know, that's the uh, the little end of year break that we get. But yeah, going good. Great week out there in California. Uh, came back, went straight to the Cage Warriors Academy show in Holland. That was really good. Some insane prospects coming through. And of course, now we move on to the UK, Europe, leg of the world tour, two shows in Manchester, London, Dublin, Scotland, Newcastle, and then it all starts again. I was, I was talking about that break on the podcast recently. And to be, uh, to be honest, I don't really understand it. Maybe you can explain it to me. So I was like, I was looking there, it's five months since the last uh, European show, let's say for, uh, for Cage Warriors. And I, I know a lot of promotions, this is not just the Cage Warriors thing, you know, a lot of promotions to kind of take off the month of January and kind of come back, especially in the UK. I heard, you know, I, I think it was Eddie Herner, one of them boxing promoters, talking about it before, saying you can't sell tickets in January, it's a big issue in January. Is is that just the reason or is it just they want to break around that time of the year? What, what's the, the logic behind it? Well, there's a couple of things. Um, so obviously December, everyone is spending their money on Christmas presents. Like that's a, a huge financial burden for for most people. Uh, in January, everyone spent all the money on Christmas presents. Um, you know, a lot of people, look, you know, a lot of people putting Christmas on the credit card, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, the actual pay in public, it's difficult to convince people to, you know, it's, you're not just asking people to to part with ticket money. They've got to get a train to the the city where the show is. They've got to get a hotel, maybe paying for their drinks all night. You know, it's a lot of money and, you know, people just don't have that much money spare. So traditionally combat sports, uh, January, first half of February, it used to be dead until March, but but now it's kind of creeping into sort of the first half of February. But yeah, you will see that gap. And, and of course, the other reason is that all your fighters want to have a nice big Christmas dinner and uh, have a few drinks over the festive period. Nobody wants to be uh, cutting weight. You know, there used to be some uh, pretty grumpy guys, should we say, on those Cage Warriors New Year's Eve show in uh, in Dublin. Guys hadn't had their turkey dinner on Christmas Day and having to wait till the second of January to get that in. Uh, yeah, look, that all makes sense. Uh, it's funny to hear like a fan first approach sometimes because like I, all I hear these days is uh, oh the biggest gain ever. And it's like that's just the dearest prices <laughs> ever is what I'm hearing there. So that's good. I, I I do feel though like there's maybe a gap in the market for like one mid January show or something like, like some of that Christmas money can be bought in tickets for Christmas presents on the, on the morning and got it in mid January. But that's just me being a bit greedy and uh, wanting to have shows to preview. So we'll uh, we, we, we maybe we'll the next time I'm talking to Graham Boyle and I can give him the suggestion like I gave him the suggestion to do the. Inf- uh, in cage interview that time, and he he, he 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 listened to me one time anyway, so maybe maybe he'll have again. Anyway, let's get to uh, let's get to these back to back shows, and uh, they're very very interesting. And we we kind of we decided to pick out kind of five fights from the two shows to look at today, but there's a lot more than that obviously on them. And we're going to start with Emil Brown versus uh, Rafael Arnov, a very interesting fight for Emil Brown. Like he he went in, he beat Jesse O'Hallen a couple of fights ago. And I, I think when anyone, if, if people know who Jesse Holland is and know how good he is, that win was like, and he knocked him out in the first round as well. That win was a game changer. And he goes in against Janis Bashar, who's looked really, really good for the for the title. And he ended up, you know, the same thing basically happened to him. He took out one of the Uber prospects, and then Bashar took out him, who was the next Uber prospect. This is a big fight for him because obviously he lost to Skabinski before that. He lost to James Sheehan three or four fights before that as well. Like you know how much I love Omil Brown as a prospect. He's a very good prospect, but it's a massive fight for him at this stage of his career, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I don't think uh, anyone predicted um, the way that his title bout against um, Yanis Bachar ended. No, no one predicted it would end the, the way it did. And I think what a lot of people were expecting going into that one was what we saw for like you know the open exchanges. I mean, Emil Brown just beating the brakes off him, chasing him around the cage, landing those big shots. But then, boom! This is MMA. You know, big two big lads like that. One clean punch lands, and and that's all she wrote. 
this is huge now for Emil because, it, as you say, you know, he lost that fight to Skabinski uh, much earlier in his career. Obviously, he lost to James Sheehan. James Sheehan right there at, at the top of the cage Warriors welterweight division now. If Emil Brown wants to stay in that top of the division pack, he needs, uh, for my money, not just a win here, but he needs an, an emphatic win. He needs another one of those finishes uh, like we saw against Jesse Holland, like we've seen countless other times in cage Warriors. You know, he's got that ungodly power in his hands I have to remember as well he's also got good crown and pound he's got good submissions too i think he won his first two cage warriors fights uh, by a standing guillotine so he, he's definitely got the skills he's got the ability uh wherever the fight goes just needs to get over that hump and start putting some wins together now but i think in a guy like aronov uh got some momentum on his side after a, a dramatic cage warriors debut he also likes to stand and bang i think the recipe's there for a very entertaining fight a hundred percent. Like, watch his side. It's funny his his record. Aronov, whose name I absolutely butchered to start it off. His, his record. It's three and two in, in Sherdog. I think it's like five and four other places. I don't know. Maybe there's some amateur fights or something like that thrown in there. But anyway, he kind of lost his early fights, but he's come back and and won his last few. And you know, he's um his last win, as you mentioned, in his case, where his debut again uh, against uh, Ben Petrus Kelly, like. When something like that happens, you know Ian Dean just knows something, doesn't he? Or someone has, you know, there's there's a coach there has said, like, this guy is on his way up or something like that because, you know, th there, there's definitely a bit of inside information. <laughs> that, uh, the quality of this guy, it's it's just gone to the next level. And watching a, a couple of his fights, I you know, you can you can kind of tell that he's... I, I describe his style as kind of a bouncy boxer. He just throws all the time, you know, Um I, uh, it's funny. He's a. I. I. I was looking and I wrote in my notes that like, he's a counter striker that call, throws the counter strike before the strike from the opponent comes. You know, he's just a madman and absolute finish as well. And in the other side of it, like Emil Brown, he. I, you know, I was talking to you just beforehand there. That I was speaking to Fabian Edwards. He reminds me a bit of Fabian Edwards. You know, he fights in that southpaw, comes forward, kind of protects himself with that shoulder coming forward. Um. The one a, a big issue, but a positive for him as well. He's very, he's very, very comfortable getting punched, which can be a blessing or it can be a curse, as we saw obviously in his last fight. But he's that lightning left hand. He's a very good guillotine as well. Like the takedown defense can be iffy at times, but I think it's because he's so comfortable at coming forward. Like watching the two of them, this is just a recipe for an absolute banger because Emil Brown does not take a backward step. Uh, and Aronov just throws non-stop. Like, I, I don't see anything other than the, the two of these lads just absolutely just banging off each other for, for as long as it goes here. Is that, is that the way you see it too? Or could, could you see a bit... Uh, is a takedown possible here or anything like that? I, I feel like it isn't. No, I, I mean, look, it's MMA, so anything can happen. You know, we, we could see uh, five, three rounds of uh, wrestling exchanges, but I, you know, I very much uh, very much doubt it with these two. I don't think Emil's going to have to worry uh, about the takedown. I, I thought he might have to worry about takedowns from Yanis Bichar uh, as that fight went on, but uh, of course it didn't. I don't think he's going to have to worry about them from uh, Aronov here. Uh, Aronov, I think he's going to be uh, filled with confidence that he knows you can put Emil Brown down with, with a shot. And, you know, he, he throws with a lot of power himself. So I think he's going to be keen to go after Emil early on. I think Emil just needs to be careful here. He just needs to be a little bit patient. You know, it's very easy when you've got the kind of power that you know can switch guys off with one shot. It's very easy as soon as you smell blood to get reckless. Well, he's learned that lesson now. And I'm sure all the guys uh, ahead of this fight will have been drilling that into his head. Just be patient. The, the power's always there. It's always going to be there. Be patient and pick your shot. If you can do that, uh, I think he's got a great chance of winning this one. But, you know, a runoff, very unpredictable, a finisher himself. Uh, it's it's going to be fireworks whichever way it goes. 100%. And as you said as well, with all those big car cards kind of coming up, you know, going to be in Dublin, going to be, I'm sure, London and all around, uh, all around the UK as well. Like, Emil Brown is never too far away, I think, from being back in that title mix. You know, James Sheehan, I saw him tweeting the other day. I'm sure he's, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe that's a rematch we see even before it's, it, it gets for a title or something like that. But I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing this. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to pick all Emil Brown as my pick. Obviously, you can't give your picks there, but I, I'm going to give all Emil Brown as, as my pick. Um, but I, I do think it's going to be a, a barn burner. Um, let's talk about Stefano Paterno versus Scotty Stockman. I, it was interesting, right? And just before we get into the specific fight itself, there was, I suppose, over the last while, a lot of the, a lot of the promotions in Europe have really 
come to the fore. You know, like obviously Gage Warriors are doing well, but like we don't care, stop even around for years. Octagon as well. And there was, I don't know, there was maybe a general feeling that this was going to hurt Cage Warriors because there's a lot of money being thrown in and all. But the funny thing is, right? I'll, there's a lot there's talent just going back and forth and back and forth between all the promotions and it's actually helped it's helped Octagon it's helped KSW it's helped Cage Warriors and I think it's really made the scene so much stronger because when you have a guy again obviously like Ian Dean you know picking up this talent it's it's really really beneficial and like the, the reason I say that is Stefano Paterno who's won his last three fights in a row, fought last in Octagon. I, I went back and I watched that fight, and my, my good friend Brian Lacey said on commentary, this is one of the best welterweights in Europe. And to see him then moving over to Cage Warriors, that's a very good sign, I think, if you're a Cage Warriors fan and you want to see some of the best uh, welterweights, lightweights, whatever it is, in uh, in the promotion. So uh, have you seen that? Obviously, you've noticed that as well. A lot of the, lot of the talent be moving around. It's a real, real healthy scene at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's obviously happening a lot, and it's going to continue to happen. You know, um, everybody knows that uh, every promotion in Europe, to an extent, has their benefits. Um, you know, from the larger promotions to the smaller promotions. Um, you know, even you, you're still getting guys fighting on on you know very good guys fighting on regional shows because you can get onto the contender series now with a few good performances on a regional show. You know, if you're fighting on a show like FCC that have been on on, on Fight Pass this past year, uh, you know, you, you're getting watched by guys you might not have otherwise been getting watched by um and, and of course everyone knows the progression from cage warriors to the ufc if a guy like stefano paterno is thinking i quite fancy the contender series this year or i quite fancy ultimate fighter later in the year or you know get getting back on the ufc's radar he knows this is a great place to do it um he's a former champion in cage warriors uh the fight that he lost the title in for my money very very close fight uh, against Ross Houston back in the day. And if you if you have seen that fight, you remember, I think it's fourth round, Paterno rocked Ross Houston with one of the most brutal shots I've ever seen. How Houston didn't go down, I, I will never know. Um, but, you know, this is a dangerous, dangerous guy. He, he's stopping guys. I think, uh, I want to say nine uh, KOs or TKOs on his record from 16 wins. Uh, and he's been doing that at a, a very high level for a long time. He's not... He's not been as active uh, as he would have liked to have been over recent years. Obviously, uh, you know, I think he was signed to Bellator Europe uh, during the pandemic uh, and obviously there weren't the opportunities there. Um, but he's had a few wins, I think he fought end of last year and you know, he's going to be looking to get back in there, get active now. Um, and he's got a fantastic opportunity to do this. It's unplugged. It's going to be a, a, a small, intimate environment. So the pressure's off. It's not like he's he's walking back into... Um, you know, against a guy from Liverpool who's got 2,000 fans there and, and he's walking back into the lion's den. I think the, the pressure's going to be off on Paterno um, and it's a very good opportunity to make a big splash on what's going to be a big weekend of mixed martial arts. 100%. And his opponent, Stockman, is, I, I describe him as like an old school striker. He reminds me a little bit of uh, Robbie Lawler, young Robbie Lawler, kind of just flings in his shots. He, got, he looks tired after about 30 seconds, but he keeps doing it. He just keeps fighting the same way, and I love that. It's like, it's, he just, he's one knockout as well on YouTube. Spinning back fist, riding against the cage, absolutely put a guy's lights out. He's very dangerous. And then, like Paterno on the other side of it, then he's all about control and that, like that left hand. It's like, you know, he's he's almost as you want to string with that left hand. The jab is really good. A fast counter left hook. He's powerful as well. You know, plus you add in the wrestling, which you mentioned there. Well rounded. He's like, he's very effective. You know, I've just. Uh, Leon Edwards I'll, I'll mention a guy who doesn't look outstanding but is just very 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 effective is uh, now the, f the first fight we talked about is kind of you know attacking striker against attacking striker this is more of like a controlled striker mixed martial artist against the attacking striker well, uh, what way do you think that's going to work out because you know Paterno's maybe fought at a higher level but you know Statman is coming in from obviously you know over in America and, and getting this big opportunity now to fight in cage whereas after fighting you know he's fought for the Anthony Pettis promotion he fought for uh, for the PFL and everywhere else it's a big opportunity for him as well traveling across the you know a, a across the uh, the pond, I suppose, from Roof of Sport to to, uh, to take on this. It's a big opportunity. It is a big opportunity. Look, I don't want to jinx anything, but I, I think, you know, we'd probably be pretty safe letting the judges go home before the co-main event starts on this card. I'm, I'm predicting finishes either way. 
for, for both of the uh, these fights and, and that's what you get when you get dangerous finishes in there um again don't want to jinx it don't we don't want to have a, a three-round jab fest with no one landing it anything good but um I, I don't think there's much danger of that to be honest uh you're absolutely right sean in your assessment in terms of the level of guys that they th they've fought I, I think paterno has fought a much higher level of opponent um than stockman's had the chance to yet but you know conversely P paterno has been around at the, at the top of the scene in europe for a long time he's fought in a lot of big european shows and obviously the level is going to be a bit higher there um Scotty Stockman, as you say, a big opportunity to upset the apple cart here. You know, his record's good. He's got a lot of impressive finishes. The question is, can he do that against that next echelon of fighter? And he's going to have a, a fantastic opportunity to do that in Paterno. I mean, you know, you rock up in Cage Warriors and you get one of those first round finishes against a former Cage Warriors champion. Well, all of a sudden you're knocking on the door of that, that title pitcher as well. So uh, big stakes here for both guys. Uh, before we move on to, to one sixty eight, what, what else are you looking forward to on, on that card? I know there's some standout names. Um, uh, Michelle Pagani is back on this card and a few others as well. To talk us through a couple of the matchups there that maybe we, we should be looking forward to on, on that uh, first night of, of fights. Uh, I think Leon Arms is one to uh, to look out for. He's a training partner of uh, George Hardwick and Harry Hardwick. We saw him get a, a quick submission victory in his pro debut in Newcastle last year. Um, he's absolutely hilarious really really cool guy great personality uh he can bang um and we we saw him get a, a standing guillotine choke submission in his, in his cage warriors debut so uh definitely if you want to be that guy who knows the prospects before they're hitting the top half of the card he, he's definitely one to watch uh matthew camilleri coming back you know he didn't have the start that he wanted to his cage warriors career uh lost to shelly last year uh, in a fight where he, there was a absolutely ludicrous height disparity. I don't think I've ever seen a bigger height difference in uh, in a Cage Warriors fight than that. But, you know, Matt's a great prospect. He's training with uh, a great team in Next Generation. So very looking, very much looking forward to what he's going to do against Nicolo Salinas. Uh, and as we say, the champ, M Michele Martignoni, uh, he's coming back against Raz Bring, who's making his debut. Uh, Martignoni, of course, dropped down to flyweight when we last saw him. Uh, to challenge Shad Chak. So he gave up his bantamweight title so Dylan, Kazan, Dylan Hazan could fight Caelan Lockroom for it. Uh, went down, was unsuccessful against Shad Chak. I think that cut back down to 125 at this stage in his career was a little bit too much for him. I think he looked a bit depleted against Shad, and Shad is a guy that you need to be 110% uh, in terms of you know your cardio, your strength and conditioning and everything if, if you're going to compete with him for five rounds. So I, I think Martin, you're only back at 135 over three rounds. I think we're going to see an exceptional performance and, and, and going to be looking for him to get back in the mix, possibly, at bantamweight. It's very interesting because there's a lot, a lot of the divisions are kind of wide open at this stage as well, and definitely he's one that people uh, need to be keeping an eye on. You mentioned next gen, uh, and let's talk about Luke Riley. Do you know what? I, I'll make an admission here. I, I actually missed the Luke Riley alexander Lou fight when it happened. And do you know what? I never... I watched bits of it, but I never got a chance to watch the whole fight until this week. And do you know what? I, I think there was a lot of mistakes made with fight of the year last year. This was fight of the year. Worldwide, not just cage wires. What, what an almighty scrap. Oh, my God. It, like, you you must be sitting there watching this, Colin. It, mu it must have been insane to be sitting there. Like, how do you keep your composure during a fight like this? It's just absolute insanity. I mean, I'd like to say I was like, heavily medicated or something, but okay, I guess it's just my professionalism. I don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it it was it was unreal, you know. I, I've called loads of great fights over the years, but every now and again, you just get that surreal feeling, like you know something special is happening. You know, people are going to talk about this for ages. Um, you know, I, I always think back to um, the Nathaniel Wood Josh Reed fight. I know it's talked about all the time, but it's talked about all the time for a good reason. It, it was bananas. Uh, the, not just the fight in the cage, but the atmosphere around it. Uh, and this is the exact same thing uh, we had here. The, the atmosphere in the building was second to none. Two very, very good undefeated prospects who just wanted it. And they wanted it exactly as much as each other. And, you know, neither guy was taking a backward step. Neither was giving in. That fight was going to be a fight that had to be finished. And, and, and it was Luke Riley uh, that finished it on that day. I mean, you know, you toss a coin, though, that could have gone very easily the, the other way uh you know i think if those guys fight 10 times you know you may be looking at five wins each uh it, it was absolutely phenomenal and, and luke riley is just a phenomenal athlete incredibly tough um obviously broke his hand in that fight as well uh carried on going he's had surgeries had a, a plate put in his hand so luke riley now has a, a metal hand 
which, uh, you know, if you're an opponent of Luke Riley, it's just what you want to hear, right? He's, he's now half cyborg. Not great. Um, but no, you know, he's he's recovered well, recovered really quickly. Um, and I can't wait to see him back in there. And, and I, you know, John De Jesus, another guy. I can't, I, I can't not watch one of this guy's fights and not get excited. He's, he'll stand, he'll bang. He's got great boxing, great movement. He can take a punch as well. Um, I think this is exactly the kind of fight Luke Riley needs right now. We've seen him, uh, you know, beat an incredible prospect in Luf. Now he's gone in there against a veteran who's got big game experience. You know, John De Jesus, a little bit of a messy record, but he's on a good run of form, uh, and he's got that messy record because he's fighting high level guys constantly. Um, you can't fault the guys he's been in with, there with. He's been on some big shows, some big events, uh, and if Luke Riley is, uh, as I'm sure. Uh, is in the, the back of his mind, looking to be in the UFC perhaps by the end of the year, certainly looking to be uh, a cage rose champion by the end of the year. This is the kind of guy he's got to impress against. Well, no, no, no. Just some of the names that uh, De Jesus has been in there with. Billy Quarantillo, Pat Sabatini, Bill Algeo, Aaron Pico, Kai Kamaka the third, uh, uh, Vladislav Pavlichenko, who's, you know, and he fought in Bellator obviously a good few times. Like this lad has been in there with some very, very good uh, fighters. And I watch, it's funny, I watch kind of maybe a fight from a few years ago and a more recent fight. I think he's changed an awful lot. You know, to talk, talk about the sketch record, he's won three of his last four. And I think he's become a lot more of a kind of a controlled, mature fighter, maybe you could you could say that. Um, he's very tall and he uses that well be, better now than he ever used it before he throws those kicks from the outside the control from the outside when he does get in the inside he's kind of slicing elbows he's the biggest issue i think he has when he gets stuck on the inside he can get caught and he kind of you know it was uh, junior DeSantis used to always do this he'd throw a punch and then he'd stop and admire it and then get punched on the way back but usually he'd punch you hard enough that it wouldn't matter but he kind of a little, little bit like that as well but he's when he keeps his game plan and he's been keeping more to it recently. Very hard man to beat. Like, really, really, really hard. And that's a massive test for Luke Riley. Because, like, you look at Riley, and, you like, he's very good, but he's unpolished, you would say. You, Luke Riley's the type of guy you want to see in another five fights to see the level he reaches. But I, I feel like Ian Dean is pushing him on a little bit now, giving him that test, as you should. This is a very, very tough test. Like... Okay, we talk about Luke Riley being a madman and throwing all these big shots and coming through the war. But if this turns into a technical battle, like, can Luke Riley do that? Like, do you think he's the type of guy who will get into a technical battle? Or will, will he always try to drag it into a war? I, I don't know, man. You know, he, he just seems to love getting in that pocket and, and, and slinging heavy leather. I think at some point, he is going to have to get out of that habit a little bit. Um, you know, as his career progresses, the fights are not going to get any easier. Not that he's had many easy fights in his, in his last few. He's been in some absolute wars recently. Um, but look, that's why he's so entertaining, right? Because he's willing to be exactly what, you know, the, the average MMA fan wants is a guy who just goes out there and, you know, throws caution to the wind and puts on spectacular performances. Uh, this is a huge fight for me, like, not just for both these guys, but for the division. Like you say, Jean de Jesus has won three of his last four two in a row if he beats luke riley that's a title shot right they, it's, it's, it's got to be he's, he's, he's got to be up there at the, at the front of the queue and and obviously we all know that luke riley is, is not many more fights away from a title shot i mean look if riley gets a big knockout here obviously there there are rumors that the ufc uh is coming to manchester in, in the summer right would you be surprised to see luke riley get a, a call up to fight the undercard yeah. I, I i certainly wouldn't i'd love to see him stay in cage warriors get that title defend it maybe once uh, before he goes to the UFC, but I, I wouldn't be surprised in the slightest to, to see Luke Riley with a big win here um, in March on, on a UFC card in, in the UK in the summer. And the UFC, like, they love undefeated guys. If he goes 9-0 and here, you know, without without a shadow of a doubt, and, you know, his style doesn't help that, you know, or doesn't hurt that he's next gen, that he's the next Paddy Pillman. He even looks a bit like him. The hair goes back like him. He fights a little bit like him, even uh, uh, well, on the feet anyway. Maybe not necessarily on the ground, but uh, yeah, without a shadow of a doubt, that's it's a mass. That's a massive fight. Like that's that's the type of fight that you know Cage Warriors was built on, really, isn't it? It's this 
prospect coming through against the guy who's been there at the big shows and the big moments, and now is your time. You you know you either take it or you you know we saw with Ian Gary with Ross McMahon and Jack Grant and all these tough fights to go to the next level, and you know they took it. McGregor against Bushing or whoever else it might be, you know, and this is uh, this is Luke Riley's moment because uh, like. You, we've seen all those guys, and I suppose Auburn Elliott's the latest guy to get through, but like, who's going to be the next guy? You know, it feels like Luke Riley, he, well, maybe Paul Hughes might, might be a little bit before him, hopefully, anyway, he should have been about two years ago, but, you know, Luke Riley is, he is the poster boy, in my opinion, for Cage Warriors at the moment with the young up-and-comer, so very interested. In. What I'm also very interested in is two big boys going at it, and that's what we have with uh, Andy Clamp and, and Matty Byfield. Brad, there's not I love more than looking up a fight and going, look, okay, it's a light heavyweight fight. Oh, my, this, this could be a bit dodgy. And in scene, lads, throwing front kicks, wheel kicks, moving around, switching stances, and both of these lads are like that. I cannot wait for this fight. Like, you look at Clamp, he has that active front leg, a sneakily good wrestler as well, and very good jiu-jitsu. Uh, and Byfield, the other side of it, in big switch stance, banging jab in there very good body lock takedown he has as well two very evenly matched two very similar guys she's like someone has to be getting knocked out here like are, are submitted maybe this is this is a great light heavyweight fight and it's it's hard to get good light heavyweight fights too isn't it because there aren't many of them yeah absolutely you know uh, for me andy clamp um one of the more dangerous guys in, in the uk and european scene at that weight when it gets to the ground you know, whether he's just pinning you down and, and throwing that relentless ground and pound. I've seen him stop so many guys with over the years. Going way back to his amateur days, if he gets your back, it's curtains, right? You know, I, I, I don't remember seeing a fight where Andy Clamp took someone's back uh, and, and then didn't get the submission. You know, his rear naked choke's absolutely lethal, uh, as we saw last time out. Um, Matty Byfield, again, you know, people are like, oh, you know, he's a, another striker coming out of the Midlands. Well, nah, he's got great takedowns. He's got great ground and pound. Uh, we saw that put, put to great use in his last fight. You know, people have, have sort of said to me, oh, this is a sort of classic striker versus grappler. But I really don't think it is. Uh, I think both guys have the edge uh, in one department. But I think we're going to see a real mixed martial arts fight here, which, which again, as you say, a light heavyweight, not something you always get. You, you, you tend to get guys who are very good at one thing and maybe not so great uh, at the rest uh, at this level. But here we, we're seeing two, uh, two veterans, two guys who train under very good coaches with very good teams. Um, I believe it's going to be the main event on the Saturday night, Cage Rose 168, uh, and rightfully so, in my opinion. I... I yeah, that's it's very interesting. Like you look at Team Renegade and you see a guy at that weight class, and like you think Fabian Edwards is a training partner, but you also know Christian Neri Duncan is up there. I'm sure I'm sure they've been training together as well. It's you know, it's a great preparation and that's you know, you you look Byfield is seven fights into his career, Clamp is fourteen. So like that that experience Evan you talk about as well, you know, finishing guys and having that ability to kind of get the fight to the ground as well. You think Clamp might have a little bit of the advantage, but when you see Byfield fight it's just, it's tough to see someone, you know, it's tough to favour someone massively at this level over a guy like that. There's no doubt about it. So I'm uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, so tell me Liam Gittins is not the main event. It's a core main event, is it? I, I don't like that. What? I, I don't think it has been fi fully confirmed yet as, okay. as of the time that we're talking now. But as mm. what I believe the plan uh, for this is, is to do uh, a, fight a fight pass exclusive title fight. So like we kind of used to do with the with the old unplugs where the, the cards were split in two with two main events, it's going to be a similar thing here. So there's going to be a title fight on the fight pass portion of the card and a second title fight on the main broadcast portion. Um, the reason being is they want six fights on the main card now. So six fights with two title fights is too long. Uh, so there's got to be a bit of a concession made there. So it, it splits it up. And, and I think also sense. as well, mm -hmm. you've got Luke Riley on the main card. You've got Adam Cullen on the main card. That will be three main card fights for next gen. And that's a lot for the coaching team to deal with in a very short space of time. So uh, it, ha it has to be kind of split up uh, in that respect. But look, I think I think it's uh, it'll, it'll be a nice, uh, nice pace changer for the card. Um, look, this is going to be a sick fight, whether it's the first fight, whether it's the last fight, whether it's somewhere in the middle. I'm, um, uh, I'm only I, I'm only sticking up for Liam Gittins because he was the Sheehan Shaw Cage Warriors fighter of the year last year. I, <laughs> and, and why not? Why yeah. shouldn't he be? You know, I, I remember talking this this time uh, this time last year, maybe, and you know he was putting a bit of a streak together, and you know he won a couple of featherweight, and 
you know, I was saying, you know, everyone's talking about the, the Harillas of the world and the Vigenics of the world. Like, we're going to have to start talking about the Liam Gittins of the world uh, at some point. And, you know, a couple more fights in the bag. He's, he's on a four-fight win streak. Uh, his teammate gets injured, uh, and he takes the opportunity with both hands, fights the best fight of his career against Reese McEwen. Uh, for my money, he's an incredibly talented athlete uh, in his own right. Liam Gittins just put the pace on him, outstruck him, outworked him, uh, and he's rightfully... Uh, the Cage Warriors bantamweight champion. But he's got a hell of a test in Roberto Hernandez, a guy who, you know, he, he's obviously competed exclusively on the uh, the Cage Warriors cards over uh, in San Diego, but he's been cleaning house uh, and getting some really uh, big names under his belt. Obviously fought uh, John De Jesus, um, fought Trevin Five Star Jones most recently, a, a close fight. Um, uh, before that, Toby Misek was able to stop him with, with a sick body shot. We know that Liam Gittins loves the body shots as well. Uh, I, I'm not sure we're going to see a finish in this one, but I think we're going to see a whole lot of violence. 100%. Like, one of his last nine in a row, Hernandez. Gittins won his last five in a row. This is two real in-farm guys. And I suppose, you know, maybe more of a striker versus grappler fight than, than maybe the, the, the last one we talked about. Like, Gittins, he's just so strong on top. Um and he like he just keeps attacking you, has punches in your face at all, uh, all times. And you know what I love about Gittins, right? I, I was talking recently about cadence in a fight, uh, the, the cadence of a fight. I love to, like he starts fast, but then from say rounds two to five, he fights the same pace, and it's just this go forward. I'm never going to stop. I'm never going to get tired, and you are type of pace. And that is that must be frightening for an opponent. They're like this guy, I just can't get away from him. I can't get a breather for a second, and he's able to do it so effort effortlessly. It's it's brilliant to watch. And then Hernandez on the other side as well. He has very good cardio as well, though. So maybe like maybe he's found his match in in, in that side of it. But as I said, great boxer, great combos. The biggest issue, I think, for him is in the transitions. I think Liam Gittins will have a big advantage there if he can make a kind of a scrappy fight where there is a bit of a, a body lock, a bit of, maybe a bit of a takedown, and he can win maybe those battles. Uh, and if he gets a fight to the, the floor, obviously he's an advantage over most people. But uh, as you said, Hernandez looked great against De Jesus and... This is a this is a tough fight. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the, uh, how the bookies uh, <laughs> uh, make this one out because, honestly, this should probably be a, a pick em fight in, in terms of the bookies. I think it's going to be that close because, uh, you know, you have, I feel like, as you, as you say, kind of getting, I don't know, does he get the respect he deserves for what he's done over the last while? Uh, like, what, going back and, and reviewing the year last year, I really wanted to give him my fighter of the year because of that. Because, like... He's not just did he achieve a lot. I think he achieved a lot without people thinking he was going to achieve a lot, which makes it even more special. I think so. You know, I'm I'm definitely not doubting him coming in here, and uh, you know, I I think a lot of people might might be picking Hernandez based on the nine wins in a row and based on what he's done. But I I definitely wouldn't uh, I definitely wouldn't rule Gittins out here, uh, Brad. Just, you know, I think that happened last yeah. time with Reese McEwen. You know, a lot yeah. of people were picking Reese McEwen based on him. You know, being sort of the informed guy and being on such such a hot streak. And then, you know, Gittins goes in there and changes the game. I, I think, you know, he's a guy who's, you know, he's had to perhaps be in the shadow of, of the likes of Paddy Pimblett, Luke Riley, Adam Cullen, but he's been so consistent, you know, over the years. He was a fantastic amateur fighter, um, always an exciting fight as a pro, uh, all, always has that ability to just pull an incredible performance out of the toolkit. Go back and watch his fight with Adam Amara Singer, uh, some sublime boxing in, in that fight. Um, yeah, I, I can't wait for this one. Two really good guys. Two, for my money, of the best guys at the weight um, on, on, on the Cage Warriors scene right now. Go and add it for the belt. What more do you want? 100%. Just to touch in a couple of the prospects on this, you mentioned Adam Cullen already. You know, he lost the fight a couple of fights ago. Won his last fight to get back in there. Uh, and now he's fighting Harrell Cohen, who's who's an undefeated guy. I think James Power is another guy. I, I You know, I really rate James Power. He's in a similar situation now. He's lost his last fight to Michael uh, Pajan. He's coming back in here against uh, Gianluca Araka. Big fight for him, you know, to get back to winning ways. There's a big difference between a 5-2 and two record and a 4-3 and three record, you know, but I still rate him. I, I think he's going to go to the very top. My prediction is I we see him in the UFC one day as I rate him that highly. Uh, those two lads, and wh what else in, on that undercard looking forward to? It's very strong in it. There's a lot. You, you, you look down through it and there's some good records and some good up-and-comers as well as kind of the, you know, the guys that have been around for a while, the, like the likes of Tom Mears and um, uh, Lupoli and others as well, Brad. It's a good one. 
Yeah, I, I think uh, one of the fights I'm most looking forward to, um, Antonio Sheldon versus Tom Mains. You know exactly what you're going to get with those guys. Uh, they're both going to stand in front of each other, bang it out, trade as many shots as the other can give. Uh, it's going to be fantastic value for money. Uh, a newcomer to Cage Warriors, Sheldon Ryan, trains under Pietro Menga. Uh, I've called a number of his amateur fights and uh, early pro fights on the regional scene. He's taken on Michelangelo Lupoli, who's, uh, again, a great prospect, but he's had some bad-looking Cage Warriors coming up against the likes of uh, Nicola LeBlond recently. So a very important fight for both these guys. Um, and, and a couple of nice debuts as well. Uh, Tom Nichols uh, is making his Cage Warriors debut. He's only 2-0, and but he was undefeated at amateur. Very, very entertaining guy. Um, then you put a microphone in front of him and he gets even more entertaining. You can't broadcast much of it, but he's very, very entertaining. So uh, again, you know, for the prospect watchers out there, uh, keep an eye on Tom Burton in this one. But yeah, you know, it's, it's one of those cards. Uh, it's absolutely solid from top to bottom. Um, cannot wait to uh, to be calling the action with uh, my good friend Paul Redmond on uh, on Friday and Saturday night of this week. And I believe we've got Darren the Dentist Stewart joining us on Saturday as well on commentary, um, which if you've heard him commentate before, you'll know yeah, it was always a good laugh. Brilliant so laugh, uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Indeed. Brad, thank you very much for joining me. If you're looking to check out those cards, you'll find them on UFC Fight Pass. Very easy to watch, very easy to find, unlike some other places. Um, <laughs> so just tune in uh, Friday and Saturday night, is it? Friday and Saturday night. Correct, Friday and Saturday night. Yeah. Perfect. Brad, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you to everybody for uh, listening. My name is Sean Jean for Shardock.com, and I'll see you all next time.